Welcome, everyone. Uh, you are here at TechSoup. For those, well, who doesn't know who tech, what TechSoup is? Okay, several. So for those of you who don't know, and those of you who do, TechSoup is an organization that has been around since 1987. We um, were founded here in San Francisco, and we are a global organization. Uh, we serve the tech needs of nonprofits all over the world. We're in every country that you can do business in, according to uh, our CEO. Um, so I think there's like 65 countries or something. We're all over the world. Uh, you can learn more about what TechSoup does on a kind of more tactical level is we provide uh, technology donations like software to nonprofits for shipping and handling costs. So 95% off of retail. Uh, companies like Microsoft, Cisco, Symantec, Adobe, Intuit, and hundreds of others are in our product catalog. And if you are a 501c3 nonprofit or library and you get validated by us, you can shop in our site. And that social enterprise funds the rest of our organization because we're a nonprofit. So we have a lot of educational programs. Um, and we have an innovation arm, which is a program I work for. Um, Ali, my colleague who's back there, is currently running a digital storytelling contest. Um, she's chewing, but I was going to offer her. If you want to come up in a minute and talk about that, you can. Do you want to? Sure. OK. Um, and um, that's pretty much it about TechSoup. My division of TechSoup is called Caravan Studios. We build apps for social benefit. So they aren't apps for specific nonprofits. They're more apps for different causes. And um, we have three in the marketplace. One is um, on the sign behind you, which is called Safe Night. And that app, <coughs> the, the tall vertical sign right there, uh, that app, what Safe Night does is Safe Night um, is an app to fund, to crowdfund hotel rooms for survivors of domestic violence when there are no available shelter beds. Uh, so basically, we've partnered with a bunch of domestic violence shelters and nonprofits that serve survivors of domestic violence. Um, and we talked to them, and we found out that a need that they had was when there are no available shelter beds, they send the survivors to hotels that they've worked with. But with budget cuts, a lot of these DV shelters can't afford the hotel rooms. So we kind of made the technology intervention and solve the problem by putting uh, Safe Night out there. And so everyone here could put it on their phone. And you'll get a ping saying, this shelter needs um, two nights of a hotel. And it you, you can fund it now, and it connects to your PayPal. Uh, we've also just released a new version of it called Safe Shelter Collaborative. And it works with um, human trafficking shelters. So because when there's a human trafficking bust, it's not one person that needs shelter. It's like 30. So this, the need is much bigger. So we built um, an aspect into Safe Night that is also a shelter network. So it's because um, right now what they use, what they do when they have no beds is they call their friends at other shelters. So this is like an, a national network of shelters that we built, and that's under SafeShelterCollaborative.org. Uh, the Twitter handle for Safe Night is at Safe Night App. Um, again, I am with at Caravan Studios. We have a couple other apps, uh, one that's about deploying known volunteers for emergency response, and one that's about locating free meals for youth in the summertime. You can learn all about those at caravanstudios.org. This group is the online community meetup, and we are a volunteer-run group. Tonight, we are co-producing with uh, San Francisco Tech for Good. Regina's right there. You want to say something about SF Tech for Good? Sh while she, oh, you have, a, you have a mic right there. You can just use that mic. Hi, everyone. And I see um, SF Tech for Good members here, so thank you for showing up. Um, so basically, SF Tech for Good is a meetup. We meet regularly to talk about how technology is being used for social good. Um, that includes monthly events, but also we have um, a weekly civic hack night that happens actually on Wednesdays also um, at Code for America. So um, you can check us out on meetup.com or find me and I'll point you to the URL. And uh, thank you, Regina. And we do we co-produce events with SF Tech for Good a couple times a year. Uh, the hashtag, as you can see here, is OC Tribe. So as you tweet, um, you can read your 
people, your colleagues' tweets right here. This meetup is being live streamed, so there might be some tweets coming in from the live stream as well, we hope so, so that we can amplify the conversation beyond the room, because we are online community managers. Uh, we have been doing this for about nine years. We're always looking for speakers and volunteers. I am the face on the meetup, so you can contact me that way. If Everyone in here, I assume, if you haven't, um, sign up on meetup.com slash octribe. And um, before I hand it over to our lovely speaker, I would love to see a share of hands. Does anyone have jobs that they are hiring for? Is anyone hiring? No, okay. Is anyone looking for jobs? Okay, so network, notice this. And um, also we have a Facebook group. Um, we have a, oh, thank you to my sponsors. Forgot to do that, can't forget that. So this evening, uh, the food is provided by Salesforce community cloud, and uh, the live streaming is being sponsored by Salesforce, Lithium, and Higher Logic. So thank you to our sponsors. Uh, we couldn't do it without you. Someone needs to answer the door because I can hear the doorbells ringing. Um, oh, is someone there? Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's it. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Carly of KQED, and she's going to talk about the interactive relationship between online community and the viewers on television. Okay, you can hear me, right? I feel like I'm at a piano with this mic. <laughs> it's kind of ridiculous and I love it. Okay, let me adjust a little bit. Okay. Hello, my name's Carly Seven. I am social media manager at KQED, which is the NPR and PBS station for the Bay Area. Everybody knows KQED here, right? Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yep, so I'm social media manager for KQED. Um, I've been doing it for about two years. Uh, actually, I have, this is not my first talk for this meetup. I did uh, one about three years ago. About three years ago in my capacity for San Francisco Ballet. Am I still on? Cool. Yeah, so <laughs> this isn't my first time speaking to you guys, so thank you for coming out again. Um, so. I wanted to talk to you a little bit tonight about Big Blue Live. Did anyone watch Big Blue Live on KQED 9 last summer? Excellent, some of you did. Um, so I want to talk to you a little about um, how social media was used as, uh, to amplify and promote and engage people around this huge broadcast. And obviously, I really wanted to make this talk more inclusive because not everyone is going to be doing social media for a live three-night broadcast from Monterey Bay Aquarium anytime soon. So I really wanted to give you a behind-the-scenes glimpse into how all this came about and also give you just some learnings that you can use in your everyday work as well. And also, I should note that a lot of the stuff I'm going to be talking about was actually led by amazing colleagues at PBS and the BBC and Monterey Bay Aquarium. So when I show you this stuff, please do not assume in any way that I am the originator of, of all of it. I just wanted to make that clear because um, some amazing collaboration that I'm going to go on to talk about. So. What was Big Blue Live? Obviously, those of you who watched it on KQED 9 will know this answer, but for those of you who didn't, I'll just give you a quick rundown. It was a totally live wildlife documentary filmed live at Monterey Bay Aquarium. It was a co-production between the PBS, uh, PBS and the BBC, and it was uh, showing in the UK first for three nights, and then it came to the United States for three nights. So here in the US, it was a three-night live event, and it was specifically celebrating California's marine life and the environmental comeback of Monterey Bay. And it was nominated for a BAFTA this year, which is the British Academy of Film and Television. Um, that's a big award, so everyone's very pleased about that. So I wanted to show you quickly a little preview of, of what happened. Live this summer, PBS and the BBC invite you on a wondrous adventure. Be there as the giants of the deep come home at last to Monterey Bay, to a place reborn, teeming with new life. Breathtaking! Witness their stunning return in a three-night live television event Big Blue Live begins Monday, August 31st 
only on PBS. So it was huge, basically. Let me just pause this and go again. Um, that's the kind of movie trailer style preview for it. Let me just bring that back. Give me two seconds, sorry. Okay. So, as I mentioned, it was screening in the UK and then the US, and the ratings were huge. In the United States, we had 6.1 million unique viewers, and we were adding 1.5 million viewers each night, which for PBS na live nature documentary, it's phenomenal. And so much of the audience was really young. I think we were av uh, kind of averaging 150,000 kids um, under the age of 17 at any minute, which is kind of amazing, really. And I also wanted to show you Oh, this isn't, I'm so sorry guys, that wasn't uh, on my screen. There you go, there we go. And here's a little um, glimpse of what the control room would have looked like while the broadcast was going on. And so where does KQED come in? Uh, KQED is obviously the Bay Area's PBS station and Big Blue Live was a big winner for us as well. Our ratings were twice the national average for all three broadcasts, all three nights. And in fact, we ranked number two and number three amongst all public TV stations. So people were tuning in and they were loving it. Tuning in like this, and this was just one of the thousands of types of tweets like this that we got. Uh, even never mind the people who are tuning in on television for social media, Big Blue Live was huge. The hashtag Big Blue Live trended nationally each night, I believe, and we placed in the top five TV shows being discussed on nationwide social media for all three nights, with over 8,000 people sending around 24,000 tweets about the show over those three nights. And when I say it was placed in the top five TV shows, that includes shows like Dancing with the Stars which kind of gives you an impression of just how big this was. And as of September 3rd, which was the morning after the last broadcast, there were over 98,000 total mentions of Big Blue Live across social media around the US. And obviously the number has risen since then to well over 100,000. Obviously PBS made a really comprehensive website with a big social hub, and that's a little look at what it looked like. It was really pulling in information from all around the web and there was an activity counter there to kind of build a sense of momentum, an activity map to show who around the United States was talking about Big Blue Live and kind of generate this real sense of occasion because like this is a three night live nature TV event. This stuff doesn't happen every day or even every year quite frankly. So, social media was so crucial to the success of this show, just not just as an advanced promotional tool, but also during the broadcast itself. So I want to step back a little bit just to show you how it was used to build buzz in the months leading up to the broadcast in late August. What you can see here, we called character cards. We referred to the animals of Monterey Bay Aquarium as charismatic, which is exactly what they are. So. Um, it was such a gift, really, to be able to um, what material to work with, essentially. I mean, Monterey Bay Aquarium is a fantastic place, and its exhibits are wonderful. And just to have that raw material to work with um, for TV purposes was incredible. So these character cards, you, we had 10 animals. They're kind of baseball-style character cards. Um, and they were uh, all decided in collaboration with the BBC and PBS working with Monterey Bay Aquarium. So they're all scientifically accurate. Um, so PBS designers, I believe, were the ones that worked really hard on these to create these gorgeous looking character cards. And so we all determined a schedule of who would release what character card when. So this kind of shows you just how much collaboration there was going on behind the scenes across time zones, across continents um, in the months leading up to this broadcast. So we shared these across Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr with a view to building buzz before the premiere. We also had a picture quiz, and here you can see an example of KQED tweet saying, hold your hands up, another big blue live picture quiz is coming here in about 10 minutes. So what was the picture quiz? This was a really fun user-oriented campaign, mini campaign really, campaign within a campaign, um, using close-up shots of uh, natural things, basically. It could be a close-up of an animal or a bone, 
Um, I believe this one's a, a whale's tooth, I think. But here, this kind of illustrates how we did this. And again, this all originated with the great minds at PBS and the BBC. Um, so one of the partners being, you know, us, PBS, BBC, Monterey Bay Aquarium, one of those partners would tweet, you know, what am I? Here's a clue, here's a close-up picture. And then another partner would tweet a slightly zoomed out picture with another clue, and then so on and so on. And this would happen at very different times. Uh, one of these happened early on a Sunday morning, I remember, because that was prime time in the UK. So we all had to get up nice and early on a Sunday. So that kind of gives you an idea of the, of the, um, you know, the diversity of where we were placing these and how. That was, this was a six-week campaign, these picture quizzes. All the partners were involved, and it was kind of a, an educational campaign, you know, education by the back door. Like, th these are fun facts, but we kind of, um, you know, we wanted people to really enjoy participating and tweeting as their clues and shouting out the people who were guessing it right and, and adding value as well, as I'm going to go on to talk about. When you're leading up to a broadcast, you know it's going to happen, you know it's starting on August 31st, and the last thing you want to do is just be re repeating, reciting the same tune-in message again and again and again, so you have to get creative, and this was just one of the, the ways that we did. Also as well, Monterey was on KQED's beat, which is, which is such a fantastic thing to be able to, to show. Um, we've been covering uh, Monterey Bay Aquarium and its conservation successes for uh, years and years now. So we had an amazing archive of material to delve back into. And it was such a wonderful opportunity to say to people, hey, you know this really big t TV event that's happening in your backyard Bay Area? The great thing about it is if you're intrigued about Monterey Bay, come to KQED Science's pages. That All the information you need is there, um, showcasing the local expertise and the knowledge, and also, frankly, assets as well. Like I say, when you're repeating the same tune-in messages again and again, you want to get creative with the stuff you have. Um, and we've got years of reporting that's come out of that area and fantastic photographs, lots of them about otters. Otters are gonna be a recurring theme throughout this presentation, because um, people really love them, who knew? We also got silly. <laughs> if, can, if, if everyone can see those. Um, we, we had fun with memes. We started at sea memes, so hashtag sea shows, hashtag sea celebrities, hashtag sea novels. Um, and this stuff's infectious. Um, again, you know, a lot of this stuff came out of PBS and the BBC, and they would originate these really fun memes, and we'd just go to town. I mean, some of it would be pre-organized and kind of scripted, and other, you know, other stuff was, was just totally off the cuff. This was me, you know, my um, Are You There card, It's Me Margaret, which is it's the worst pun I've ever <laughs> said. Um, but PBS retweeted it, so that's okay. And like I say, this stuff is infectious, and when you've got organizations like big esteemed organizations like the BBC, PBS, KQED tweeting each other with really silly stuff like Benedict C. Cucumber Batch, celebrities. It's, you can't help but have fun essentially. And it's also really fun for users to see their favorite organizations bantering back and forth online. And it's even better for them when they contribute and get retweeted or acknowledged. And that was a big part of what we did. We also, at KQED, we were fortunate enough to be able to do a contest. Um, obviously, for national organizations, they have limits on the kind of contesting they can do for legal reasons. But we're a regional station, so obviously we have um, fa a fantastic legal counsel who tell us what we can and cannot offer. And this was something that we could offer. So we worked with Monterey Bay Aquarium to put together this really great prize package, um, a night at a Monterey uh, hotel and a tailored tour behind the scenes at Monterey Bay Aquarium. So basically, the, the winner could say to the aquarium, I really love uh, eels, or I really love otters. And Monterey Bay Aquarium would kind of put together this package tour for them, like just them, one-on-one -on -one for an hour. And so we challenged people. We called this the hashtag significant otter giveaway. And so we challenged people to share that image, which you know is branded Monterey Bay Aquarium, Big Blue Live. KQED, and all they had to do to enter the contest was share the image on Twitter or on Facebook with their worst otter pun imaginable. 
And we weren't picking the best or the worst. We just, we just wanted people to just kind of show their silliness again in the spirit of fun and infectious fun. And we attracted over 400 entries via publicly posted tweets, Instagram and Facebook posts. So every time someone entered the contest, all of their networks would see it because all of the contest entries were public. Um, and that is three times as many entries as an average KQED contest gets. So we were pretty pleased. So social media during the broadcast as well. This was absolutely crucial. One thing that was really important was that all of the shows in the US were totally streamable live. You could watch them again after the fact, but you could also watch them as if you're watching them on TV. And in a time when a lot of people, frankly, do not own televisions anymore, this was really important. I don't know about you guys. I'm not sure if, if any of you guys work for media companies, but it's tricky being having to tell people, watch this tonight at 8 p.m., go and find a television and turn it on because a lot of people just don't own them anymore. But being able to give a URL and saying, you can go to this URL now and see what you need to see, that was fantastic. Um, we also offered live cams as well that were placed around strategic points around Monterey Bay. And so, like I say, being able to have a URL that someone could just click on and start watching, that is huge for social and really removes the barriers to participation. And it really opened us up to that new... TV-less audience. And as we were live tweeting each episode, we could tell people where they could go and watch the same thing. So we also used a tool called Snappy TV. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with it. Twitter just bought it, well not just, like a year ago I think. So Twitter now owns Snappy TV and it's a way for broadcasters to plug their feeds into this tool, this online tool, and essentially snip from live television. So a lot of sportscasters do this as well. Um, and so, you know, if there's a, a, a really kind of water cooler moment that's happening on TV right now, live, that broadcaster can use this technology called Snappy TV to snip it and make it into a GIF, a meme, a straight video, a highlight reel, and you can apply branding on it and you can edit it. And then you can publish straight to your social media networks. Um, so we use that a lot and it resulted in GIFs like this. Yes, that played. I'm so happy about it. <laughs> and again, just to return to this, this tweet here, this is how people were interacting. Uh, this says, family snuggled on couch watching Big Blue Live as, uh, as I live tweet daughter's questions and comments. We got so many people asking, like, why is the whale that big? And, like, why is that otter doing that? And the great thing about being at Monterey Bay Aquarium, where we all decamped for all three nights of the broadcast, was that we had countless experts on hand to say, oh, that's why that otter is doing that. Or that's why that whale is so big. So every time people tweeted questions at us, we all talked back and we had those experts on hand every night during the broadcast to answer. And this is what the broadcast looked like as well. And you'll see that here that there's a lot of social branding. There were social moments happening on air. And if you saw the show, you'll remember they had on air polls like this. Like, what's your opinion of great white sharks? Hashtag shark fan, hashtag shark fear, hashtag on the fence. Tweet your answer. So that happened during the broadcast. And then a couple of minutes later, the broadcast would circle back and say, oh, so we've collected all the tweets, and it turns out that people really love sharks. And 8% are on the fence. <laughs> um, so that's, that's kind of big. I mean, I know it seems like... Um, a lot of shows are doing this increasingly more and more now, but to have like a live nature documentary that does this and involves its audience like this, like that isn't that common. It also resulted in really big moments like this. This does not move, unfortunately, but um, we, ha on the morning of the second broadcast, we were told that um, some folks in a boat in Monterey Bay had captured footage of an orca flipping a dolphin <laughs> in the bay and they'd filmed it, it was fantastic. So a bit of scrambling ensued and the footage became part of that night's broadcast. So it also became a huge social hit. We had GIFs of it, we had videos endlessly looping. I was sorry, I wish I had the moving footage to show you. That orca really does flip that dolphin into the air. It's insane, it looks CGI'd, but it's real, it's amazing. PBS also used Periscope a ton. They did 17 behind-the-scenes streams. We also did one as well from 
one of the uh, one of the exhibits in Monterey Bay Aquarium, and their collected 17 periscope streams had over 13,000 viewers, and it was all about showing access to things that uh, members of the public, when they go to Monterey Bay Aquarium, can't see. This was all about taking you through that big door that says "Do not enter," um, and PBS were actually nominated for a Shorty Award, the social media equivalent of the Webbies, for this, which is fantastic. It was hosted by a guy called Joe Hansen, who is the host of PBS Digital Studio. Um, film series It's Okay to Be Smart, which I really recommend you guys check out. It's great. So selfishly, how did this do for KQED? <laughs> um, well, I've already told you about our broadcast figures for that time, which were phenomenal. People loved Big Blue Live. Um, but just to tell you a little bit more about social, the reception was crazy. This is undoubtedly one of the most fun, rewarding things I've worked on in my two years at KQED. Um, let alone the, you know, the Big Blue Live trending, just the local response. People who were so thrilled that this huge national event was being filmed in their backyard to the Monterey, you know, in the Monterey Bay Aquarium that they'd grown up visiting as kids. Um, and there you can see a, a tweet saying, the Twitter commentary ranks a close second to the amazing footage from Big Blue Live. Like, what an accolade, basically. So Big Blue Live really got people seeing us. And when I talk about these stats, I'm going to pretty much talk exclusively about Twitter because people on Facebook loved it too, but Twitter was where this really lived because of that immediacy and people being able to tell us what they thought right there. And so our Big Blue Live tweets from at KQED, please follow us if you're not, um, was seen almost 430,000 times during that short broadcast period, so just three nights. And these Big Blue Live tweets accounted for almost 60% of our total impressions on Twitter during that period. So what that tells me is that Big Blue Live tweets got us in front of people. They elevated us to that status. Um, total impressions for all of our tweets over the broadcast period, that three-night period, not just Big Blue Live tweets, they were 60% higher than our impressions during the same period during the previous week. So the takeaway there is that Big Blue Live helped us reach more eyeballs even when we weren't talking about Big Blue Live. And that's the best thing, right? Because um, Big Blue Live was wonderful, but also like we're KQED, we're doing a lot of other stuff at the same time. Um, also, Big Blue Live got people talking to us. Uh, Big Blue Live tweets were somehow engaged with over 12,000 times during the broadcast period. And those Big Blue Live themed tweets accounted for 70% of our total engagements on Twitter during this period. So that you know, big picture, that tells me that engagement with all KQED tweets, not just Big Blue Live ones, was much, much, much higher than our engagements during the same period during the previous week. So again, you can see what Big Blue Live is doing for KQED Twitter. And just to step back through that full promotional period of August, when we were tweeting, we were hyping the broadcast really heavily with our friends at PBS and the BBC and the Aquarium. Our Big Blue Live tweets during that month-long period were somehow engaged with over 20,000 times through that full month. And they accounted for 22% of our total engagement during this period. And that's really no mean feat when you consider how much KQED tweets. I don't know if you follow us. We tweet a lot. And we tweet about really diverse subjects as well. News, arts, education, science, tune in, broadcast, everything like that. So amidst all that, Big Blue Live was really striking a chord, which tells us how people were enjoying it. And also, just to look at some vanity metrics, Big Blue Live got people liking us. Follower growth on Twitter jumped during the broadcast. It's, it was 30% higher than during the same period the previous week. And during that small three-night period of the broadcast, we gained as many followers as we usually do in a good week for KQED, which is amazing. And just to step back a bit, our Twitter follower growth during August, that full promotional period, it was 11% higher than the comparable period during the month previous when we weren't talking about Big Blue Live. So again, Big Blue Live is doing things for KQED. So takeaways. If you guys are not going to work on a live, of <laughs> live TV event anytime soon, there's, I still think there's tons of lessons that came out of this for me that I really want to share with you. Um, because it just relates to using social media to build and sustain and to leverage buzz around some kind of event, right? We've all done that. So this is what I learned. <laughs> These are my learnings with pictures. Collaborate. <laughs> and then collaborate, and then collaborate some more, and then collaborate with some other people. Um, the success of Big Blue Live's social media was the way that p 
partners, so many partners on so many time zones and so many continents work together to amplify each other's messages, to support each other, to kind of banter publicly, and really importantly, to introduce each other's fan bases to each other as well. I mean, PBS gave KQED national leverage. We reminded people regionally that they can follow PBS. They don't just have to follow KQED. Um, the BBC got involved as well. And so, so many people working with each other. And this is us in Monterey Bay Aquarium. We all got together during the broadcast. I'm at the back there somewhere, I think. Yes next to the woman holding her hands up. Um, yeah, we all got together in what we called the war room, this wonderful room in the aquarium. It's the best, it had the best view of any office I've ever been in because it had the view out onto Monterey Bay Aquarium. It was stunning. Um, and I know that because of our line of work, we all collaborate so much online, but there's no substitute for just getting in a room with people. I used to think that you didn't have to do that, and I feel really stupid now because you do. I mean, you don't have to do it all the time, but just getting together for those three nights, and the, okay, so I'm in the back there, and the, the two guys next to me doing that, they're from, the, from BBC, right? So they work out of the UK, they flew over. The, the other gals next to me on the, my other side are at PBS. And just having that opportunity to be around the same table with someone and all be furiously live tweeting one show over three nights from our respective streams, it's invaluable. Um, because we've all done that thing where we email someone or Slack them and just say, hey, I just tweeted something, can you just give me a retweet? But in this scenario, you can literally turn to them and say, oh, could you just retweet that? You know, and it, I, I know it sounds so simplistic, but there really is no substitute for that kind of face-to-face -face stuff. Also, lesson number two, play to your strengths, know what your strengths are, and make the most of them. And those strengths might be cute animals. There's no shame in this. Is a, oh my gosh, otters, a gift for social. Um, there's no way we were ever going to, to kind of to turn that down and know your strengths and just use them. Um, obviously, we really did showcase the diversity of the wildlife that was being featured in, in Big Blue Live, but, you know, otters. Should we just return to them again and again? People love them. Um, you can sometimes try and be too clever around your content as well, and you sometimes have to just boil it down and just say, no, this is what, you know, people are engaged with this. Just show them. And again, as I mentioned, KQED Science, we got years and years of coverage of Monterey Bay Aquarium and everything people wanted to see. And also, one of our strengths for KQED was, was our proximity. We could take people there because we were there. You know, it's only because I was there in that amazing room overlooking the bay that I was able to take that photo there and generate that kind of original content. Sometimes there is just no substitute for being there in person. Lesson number three, everything is social. Everything is social. You should bake social media into everything. It's, it's like that kind of marketing versus digital marketing divide we always talk about, and now we know that it's not digital marketing, it's just marketing. You know, there's, there's no distinction anymore. The same goes for social. And this means seizing amazing opportunities when they present themselves, like that, that orca footage, you know, of the dolphin being, being flipped. Um, and being on site was so invaluable because we made all of our you know, IRL activations, really social. We provided photo booths for people. We sent our science guys down there to meet people. And this is one of the presenters of Big, Do Big Blue Live, Dr. M. Sanjan, being silly with our gigantic otter cutout that we took down to Monterey. Um, so photo booth fun, hashtags, great opportunities. Recognize what you can make social and then use it. Don't be shy about it. Lesson number four, be human, like this guy. <laughs> Um, and I love that we're talking about being human uh, around Big Blue Live, which was all about animals, but showing your humanity, especially when you're you know, tweeting or posting for a big organization is so important. Um, and it's such a lovely opportunity as well, because like PBS was being goofy, KQD was being silly, and people were loving it. And more, most importantly, the dialogue on this was, was two-way. People were responding to us, and then we'd come right back at them. This, by the way, was our most popular tweet in all of our tweeting through Big Blue Live. So it says, happy humpback day, folks. It was a Wednesday. Happy humpback day, folks. Can you believe it's the finale? 
<laughs> of Big Blue Live tonight at 8 p.m. Breach for the stars. Anyway, silly puns, hashtags, humor. People were loving it. So we kind of optimized every single day. We were like, what are people enjoying? Let's refine that, make it even better, and give them more of it. Another lesson, be prepared. The prep for all of this whole Big Blue Live circus jamboree, it began so long in advance, and I have amazing colleagues at PBS and BBC to thank for that. Months and months this was planned out. Everything was being amassed, images, assets, gifts, videos, those character cards, those picture quizzes I showed you. Everything was all assembled and ready to go. And not only were the assets ready, the timing and the scheduling and the, you know, who's going to tweet this at what time, that was all mapped out as well, which is an amazingly organized way to work, I have to say. But these are the kind of results you get. And so having you know, all those assets amassed is really helpful if, as I said earlier, you're, you don't want to be repeating the same tune-in message again and again and again. Um, I know we talk a lot about uh, repeating ourselves to our audience because you know we get sick of the messaging, but they're probably only just hearing it on the 10th or the 12th or the 20th time. And so if we're telling people it starts August 31st, you know you need to find different ways of conveying that fun message. So this is, you can't see this, but this is a GIF. This you know float, don't run to your nearest screen. Silly stuff like that. Also, be prepared, but don't be afraid to grab opportunities like that amazing Orca video I showed you. And know a great social media opportunity when you see it. And don't be afraid to deviate from the plan. I can sometimes be like that. I can be quite rigid. I can be like, oh, well, I, I have a tweet for 8, 8 p.m., so we can't replace it. you know. And then I remember, what am I doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way to think. Um, like I say, some of the best footage that came out of this, totally unplanned. And this is a fun opportunity, actually, that demonstrates um, how many of you listen to the California Report on KQED Radio? Yes, thank you. Um, so they, <laughs> I love it, they're amazing, and they did a live, bro they did a broadcast, I can't remember whether it was live, but I think it was a broadcast from Monterey Bay Aquarium, and they got the credits of the show read out by a diver underwater. And they took some video and they took, some, they took a photo of it. And what a great opportunity. And I don't think anyone knew at the beginning of that day <laughs> that a diver was going to be <laughs> reading the credits to the California report. So again, seize those opportunities and just make them happen because you know that people will love them. You guys know your audience and you know what they enjoy. Another lesson, invite people in. It's, I know we talk such a lot about creating community and a sense of, you know, you belong here, come in. Come in and be with us and talk to us. Um, but it's one thing to talk about it and it's another thing to actually make good on that. Again, talking about the invaluable nature of actually being on site. You know, I was just wandering around the aquarium and I saw these little um, the, uh, penguins snuggling after hours. Apparently they do that when the, uh, the aquarium's being cleared out, when it gets really quiet. The penguins know that everyone's left and they just take the opportunity to snuggle. <laughs> and I saw that and I asked one of the docents, I was like, what's going on there? And he said, oh, that's what they do. And so I took a photo and put it on Instagram and people loved it. And again, it's taking people behind the scenes and saying, hey, you wouldn't normally get to see this, come in. It's like, it's like gesturing to someone um, and taking them backstage behind the scenes with you. And again, make people feel like they're part of your club. There's a really cute story behind this. Um, we had a campaign a couple of years ago at KQED called hashtag I am KQED. And we produced some kind of creative commercials around that with uh, different residents around the Bay Area holding up signs saying like, I am KQED San Jose, or I am KQED Oakland, or I am KQED San Mateo. Um, and uh, during Big Blue Live, this little girl and her, her mother got in touch with us to say, but you never say Monterey. <laughs> we were like, you're right. <laughs> we don't, and we need to rectify this. Um, so we, our fabulous design team really quickly made her a sign and sent it down to her. And then her family sent us this back, which again, make people feel like they're part of your club. This girl wanted to be in our club. And so we said, of course, come in. So another, one last thing that PBS did, which I loved, was they call it surprise and delight. I know that's a term a lot of people use. Um, but for people who are like super engagers, super tweeters uh, around Big Blue Live, they would send them t-shirts. They had these amazing t-shirts made that say like, team otter, team whale, team, you know, other 
animals, um, animals and fish, uh, which was all based on an online quiz that they had made, you know, to find out what animal you're most like. So people would tweet PBS, and if they did it enough, or if they were funny, or if PBS just really enjoyed interacting, um, they would get a T-shirt in the mail, which, you know, like opening that parcel, that would feel really, really good. Um, so that's another way, again, of just showing your humanity, inviting people into your club, and letting people know that, you, that they belong. So that is a very quick rundown of what happened in that crazy summer last year. <laughs> um, so yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> Who has questions? We'll do, um, we're going to pass the mic around for questions. Uh, so please don't just shout them out. Wait till you get the mic. Um, but raise your hand, let us know if you have questions, and we'll, we'll have questions for Carly. Great. Um, I'm curious about the, the content calendar or whatever you mm -hmm. called it, because you obviously had been working on that for months and yeah. anticipating uh, the amount of tweets and, and how are you going to populate. The, the feed and, and what did that look like? And I'm just curious because that's an awful lot to put your arms around. No, that's around. a great question. Um, I recall that we used Google Calendar. That was really helpful. Just uh, logistical stuff like, Carly, uh, on this day, tweet this at 8 a.m. You know, great reminders like that. And in terms of um, content calendaring, uh, I think that we used uh, just a lot of documentation, really, that was uh, open access so people could get into it and edit it whenever they needed. And again, it was like a framework, like a detailed framework, but with the ability to stay loose around it and be nimble and take advantage of great opportunities that presented themselves. Um, but I always think there's no easy way to schedule up that stuff or calendar that stuff, you know? Um, I always find that, it, you know, it because there's such a lot of information there, you just have to try and uh, do it in a format that makes sense for you. So I think we used a lot of Google Docs, a lot of Google Docs, um, which is great, because then everyone can collaborate and access it, so. Thank you. Hey there. Um, so I have a question about the feature program that this was all based around. Um, hopefully this is relevant to everyone else, everyone here on the kitty tables of video production companies, so we might get a little nerdy with it. Um, so from what I understand with live television is, you know, like for sports, it, you see a home run on TV, that act happened seven seconds prior to that. Ooh. And so you're saying live here, two things I didn't think were possible with live was working with animals <laughs> or documentaries. So what actually was the feature program and how was that how was that live? I, obviously, the social campaign was live. Yeah. But I'm curious of how the feature was actually live. A ton of it was live, like the, the vast, vast majority. They would sometimes cut away to pre-prepared packages, you know, very explicitly saying, and now we're going to look at what happened earlier in the day in the Bay. Um, but the presentation was live. There was a ton of filming that was live. Um, a huge amount of it was live. And a lot of people kind of... Um, you know, didn't think that it was possible because, again, animals and live, like, how can that happen? But, uh, but it did, so, yeah. And they had two feeds, so they had an East Coast feed and a West Coast feed. Um, and the East Coast feed um, obviously happened earlier on in the day. Uh, and totally different things happened in, in, both, uh, in both feeds. Like, they do nighttime diving in the West Coast feed. Um, but in terms of the delay, I actually don't know. I'm not on the, on the production side, so I wouldn't be able to answer that accurately. <laughs> I, I think I someone understand. So it was a scripted um, presentation of the Monterey Bay Aquarium that, and then it was they went through this script live, and then of course as oh, things yeah. happened, being it was a live show, yeah. Yeah. like any live shows, they would leverage whatever live events or, or Absolutely. like you said, the orca. Yeah, um, with again, just like it happened on the social side, I think they built in that flexibility to say, hey, something's happening over there. <laughs> and go over there um, because of the live nature of it. But um, one thing I didn't mention was that social really was baked in to, to that element as well, you know, scripting, um, those social call outs. Oh, this moment's gonna you know, work great for social media, that kind of thing. It was a real consideration, so thank you. Any more questions? Did you do anything, or how did you keep the uh, momentum going after the live um, show was was over? That's a great 
question, actually. Um, and that reminds me, I did have a section in my earlier draft about this very topic. And I'm wondering, you know, when you look at presentations, you're like, where did you go? <laughs> so I'll just say it. Um, yeah, I had a whole section about, um, yeah, once you've got people, like, don't waste them. Because I think we can be so focused on acquisition. Like, yes, they followed us. Yes, they tweeted us. Like, job done. And it's like, no, it's not done. <laughs> You've got to continue it for years. Um, and so we were very keen to, to do that follow through with people. And, and it wouldn't make sense as well if all we talked about was Monterey for, like, months. And then uh, on September 4th or something, the, day, the morning after the broadcast, if we just, you know pulled the plug and never talked about it again. So um, we really did kind of taper down. Um, we did a lot more follow-up saying, you know, wasn't that amazing? Watch the highlights. If you missed it, here's where you can listen. Um, you know, here's where you can watch online. Uh, repurposing our kind of best of stuff. KQED just re-aired the, the best of, actually. Uh, I think last week, yeah, the best of Big Blue Live a kind of re-edited package. Um, but we would very consciously keep people up to date with, with what is happening at Monterey Bay Aquarium. A couple of days ago, it was National Penguin Day. Um, and Monterey Aquarium did some amazing stuff with Facebook Live. I think they somehow just got this troop of penguins. What's the collective term for penguins? It's not troop, I'm sure. Anyway, a bunch of penguins <laughs> and got them like, to walk through the hall at, at Monterey Aquarium. And, and we knew like, oh, for all our fans that love Big Blue Live, we should definitely show them that. Um, but you know, that's such a great point and I'm glad you raised it, that once you've got people, that's not enough. It's what you do with them afterward um, because you, you don't want them to feel like, oh, I, I followed you because you do all that fun wildlife stuff and, and now you're not doing any of that fun wildlife stuff, you know? Um, but we do. Wednesdays are kind of nature nights on, uh, on KQED 9 for those of you who watch PBS, so... I would definitely tune in from 8 p.m. <laughs> uh, I actually have a follow-up to that. Did Hi, you, um, kind of related to the social side of things and related to kind of the follow-on effect, did KQED see kind of an, an increase in conversion to any of kind of the more business-oriented things? Oh, you mean like, like membership? memberships? and That's a and great donations, question. Things like that. You know, I actually, I'm not best placed to answer that. I would love to know myself. I would imagine we did. Um, I think it's all about demonstrating value. You know, it's, it's support and uh, affinity with PBS, KQED. Like, this is the kind of thing you're getting. Like, this is ludicrously ambitious, this whole project. But for anyone who watched it, it, it was just fantastic. Um, yeah, and I, th I think it is about demonstrating that value. And social is a huge part of that. And I do think, I know this is another topic altogether, but I know that no one really has cracked that nut yet of how best to leverage social when it comes to membership and fundraising. But I think social definitely has a really important part in connecting people to you as well, because you know if it's your favorite channel and you watch it or your favorite radio station and you talk to them on Twitter and they talk back to you, like that's pretty significant. We didn't used to be able to do that with the organizations we loved. That's a fairly new thing. Um, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what kind of impact that has on those kind of deeper relations, those business relationships, like you say. Thank you. Hi. Um, Hi. So I know that you said that PBS did the uh, giveaway of T-shirts and things. Yeah. But do you know um, how they orchestrated that? Did they then like direct message people and ask for their addresses and sizes or... Was it just kind of like everyone gets a large and we, like, <laughs> and you, you just know. live with it? <laughs> yeah, like um, I was just wondering, like, and if you know about, like, did they ask them to then tweet a picture of themselves or share a picture of themselves on social and when they got it? When they got it, um, like, if you know anything about that, because I feel like the after effects of that is yeah. probably really cool. I don't actually know whether they asked people to do that, but. Um, I r yeah, I'd, I would love it if they did, because that, that's awesome to say, like, hey, and if you like it, let us know. We do the same thing with giveaways at KQED. We have, like, a fairly robust giveaway program, like tickets to the moth and stuff. And, and while I'm, when I'm emailing people saying that they've won tickets, because I still do that stuff, um, I always say, like, hey, and if you, if you enjoy the moth, um, you just give us a shout-out, will you? Just tag us on Instagram or something, because we'd love to know that you enjoyed it. Um, so I think it's always smart to do that kind of follow-up. Um, and if they, PBS didn't ask people to do that, I imagine people just did it out of excitement. Um, but I think that it was a lot of direct messaging behind the scenes, like, hey, we love what you were doing. Uh, what's your address or, you know, what's your size of T-shirt? Um, I do remember we ran out of uh, the Otter T-shirts in Medium, I think, because I think that's what everyone wanted. <laughs> Hi. 
Um, <laughs> thanks for sharing. Um, it was such a beautifully orchestrated event and such a multifaceted approach to to something of that magnitude. So now that you guys know what you're capable of, what's what's next? What's next? Yeah, you've oh, taken I it wish to the I next knew. level. I wish I knew. I know, another big, big something live? I don't know. But yeah, I like, selfishly, I really hope they do another one, because yeah. I'd love to work on it. <laughs> is the organization open to more live events like that? Or? Um, I think it was a ton of work, um, but, you know, like I say, it was very collaborative, and like the impact that they were able to have with that, and to actually show it in two countries as well, like one week and then the next week, it's, it's insane. Um, yeah, and there's a, you know, I, I love the idea of kind of um, sentimentally that people in the UK got to see Monterey Bay and see what that's about. Um, I've seen a few tweets for actually from people, from British people saying that they booked vacations to Monterey <laughs> after watching it. I'm like, thank you, that's a lot of money. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I, I really hope that this is the start of, of a new kind of